Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so, uh, Philip, would you mind praying for us? No, not at all. Father, we're so thankful that we can call you Father and that you've sent your Holy Spirit to enlighten us on things that Jesus taught us, but even more than that, now that we get to look into your word, into the revelation, uh, a mystery book to a lot of people in a lot of respects, but we ask you to just open it up for us. Bless our hearts tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. I see Carol. Hi, Carol. And I presume Patrick Wade is Pat and Joe. Yes, yes sir. Right in front of you. Oh, <laughs> I looked down and then the picture appeared. <laughs> so does, does everybody have notes? My printer would only print off half of them. Oh, really? Uh, I'm sorry. No, it's just my printer. But... Is it Jan's be on email? Uh, I'm not sure if I had Jan's. I don't know if... I don't know if I have your email address. I'll have to check that. Oh, then probably it is. Yeah, it's got to be okay. then. Uh, well. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, let us know if it's not. I'll, I'll get it back. Here. With that, I'd just be happy to be hearing. Okay. All right. Okay, so then. Then tonight we actually start getting into uh, the the text itself. As um, Phil pointed out when he was praying, that um, the uh, revelation is bewildering to a lot of people, and so as we turn to the text, um, it would be nice to have kind of a road map uh, to help us as we navigate these visions of John. And so, and so be, uh, I want to look at that just for a minute, just for a bit before uh, we get into the first eight verses of uh, chapter one. Like I say there in your notes that Revelation is not a disorganized, unconnected collection of dreamlike visions. That's sometimes the way it feels when you read through it, isn't it? Um, on the contrary, it is an intricately woven literary masterpiece, and people refer to it as a masterpiece. Um, and so, uh, as such, it was intended to present a clear, unified message. When John wrote it, and the uh, first century church received it, it was uh, a clear, uni uh, un uh, unified message. Okay? Um, and notice in chapter 1 verse 3 that um, revelation was designed to bless those who read it and heard it and took its message to heart uh, and yet uh, 2,000 years later we find it um, we find it mystifying bewildering uh, and all of that. But I, I know that there are some of you, at least a couple of you, a few of you, who have, and, and maybe by now, uh, many of you, who have been listening to it or reading it straight through multiple times. And I know that at least a couple of you 
have said that as you as you do that, as you just read it straight through or listen to it straight through, um, it brings you to worship. And that was that was John's intent, as he tells us right there in in uh, chapter one, verse three. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So we'll talk about that verse in a few minutes. Uh, but um, it was designed to be clear. It was designed to be encouraging. It was designed to be a blessing. Uh, and so uh, it would behoove us, I think, just to spend a minute uh, kind of looking at how John put his book together, okay? Now, uh, at, at the very basic level, at the broadest level, we can break up Revelation into three main parts. A prologue, which is what we're going to look at tonight. A body, uh, which is everything except for the last 16 verses of the book. Um, the, the epilogue is uh, 20, chapter 22, verses 16, 6 through 21. The body is chapter 1, verse 9 through 22, verse 5. So and we can break it up that uh, like that, but that's not as helpful to na navigate the visions. Now, almost everybody agrees on the basic movement of the body of the literature, uh, of the um, letter, uh, the basic movement of the visions. Um, and I've got it listed there. Um, the original vision of Christ, then it moves to the seven letters, then the throne room, then the seal judgments, then the trumpet judgments, the, then the cosmic warfare, uh, and then the bold judgments, then the destruction of the evil empire in chapters 17 and 18, then the second coming in chapters 19 and 20, and then in, and then in 21 and 22, we have the new heavens and the new earth. Almost everybody agrees uh, that that's the general movement of John's visions. But now, when it comes to interpreting those visions and ex interpreting the flow of those visions and explaining why it flows that way, what's going on in each, uh, each item there, how each item contributes to the flow of the narrative, well, there you get lots of different disagreements. There are lots of different ways to explain how John put his book together and why the visions flow the way they flow. Lots of different explanations of, of that. And the reason that there are, is think about this for a minute. As you read through uh, Revelation, I'm, um, I'm sure if you've been reading through it and listening through it, I'm sure you realize that <clears throat> there are a lot of cultural references in the book. There's a lot of, there's also, don't know if you've picked up on some, but there's a lot of thematic connections, themes that connect throughout the book. And then there's there's uh, layers of meaning behind the book, and um, and John skillfully wove all those things together. Here's their problem: we are separated from John and those first century churches that read it. We are separated uh, from them by almost 2,000 years of cultural history. I, I forget. That's even worse than trying to zoom together. 
<laughs> Dear Pam, she says that's even worse than trying to Zoom together. Um, I, I forget which church it was, uh, which uh, letter to the letter to which church it was in, but Jesus talks to them about a white stone. To my knowledge, no commentator or scholar has dug up what in the world that's referring to. That's a real mystery. Again, it, I mean, they take guesses, okay? But, but almost every commentator is going to tell you, well, we really don't know. We haven't really, uh, uh, research hasn't really dug that one up. So there's cultural references and themes and various layers of meaning that the first century church would have picked up on because they they uh because they shared the cult john's culture they shared they had in common that first century culture and everything that was packed into it they had that that was common knowledge uh, just like uh we have a common knowledge of um uh, the 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 21st century culture and and uh, and late 20th century culture where it's just what we swim in and we have it in common and there can be cultural references and stuff like that 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 people um just uh that that there's no need to explain that we just get it Think about this, in 2,000 years, if, if somebody uh, digs up a letter and somebody says in the letter, that's like 9-11. <laughs> in 2,000 years, they won't, have a, they won't have a clue as to what that means, right? That's what we're faced with. Uh, with uh, I mean, that's what um, makes interpreting revelation much harder for us because uh, of the time difference. Uh, so that's our disadvantage. Now, the advantage we have over the first century church is we have all of these study Bibles. We have all of these concordances, dictionaries, commentaries, uh, Bible study software. We have all of those tools at our disposal. And so um, we have that advantage over uh, the first century church. The first century church, uh, most of them did not have copies of the New Testament or probably even the Old Testament. They would go to church and listen to it being read. So we have distinct advantages in this century, um, but they have distinct advantages in their century. Most yeah, like, a long, like a long attention span. We don't got that. Yeah, yeah that's another one. So are you telling me to move on? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Circle around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. Um, so for the purpose of our study, we're not going to try to come up with the perfect outline or roadmap uh, for Revelation. I didn't even try that. Um, I, I did a lot of reading on the structure of Revelation. And there's a lot of varying opinions. I don't know if two commentators had the same outline. Um, and some of them were, many of them were radically different from each other. Um, so our main purpose here is we just want a reasonable and reliable roadmap to help us navigate John's uh, visions. Um, and 
I think uh, um, the biggest clue to that is the fact that Revelation contains four separate but interrelated um, visions. And each vision is introduced by the phrase in the spirit. He was in the spirit or he was carried away in the spirit. Uh, but that, that phrase in the spirit, uh, when it is used of John, it locates him in a, in a new place. And there's also another phrase that, that we see used along with it, and that's come, I will sh uh, show you. So when you take those two phrases, um, uh, it, it seems to divide uh, Revelation up into four different visions. Look at chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. This is the only place that you don't see uh, the phrase, come, I will show you. This is the only place. Uh, verses 9 and 10, he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are, that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then he says, I heard behind me a loud voice. So this first vision starts on the island of Patmos, uh, on the Lord's day, and he was in the spirit and heard this voice. Look at chapter 4. Verse 1 and 2. After this, that is, after the vision of Christ and after the letters that uh, Jesus told John to write to those seven churches, after this, uh, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once, I was in the Spirit. And behold, he sees the throne room. So, um, this phrase, uh, I was in the Spirit, come, I will show you, I was in the Spirit, uh, shifts, uh, locates him in a different location. He was on Patmos. Now he's in the throne room. And then chapter 17, the first three verses. I'm sorry, what chapter? 17. The first three verses. John writes, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come. I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated uh, on many waters. Uh, jump down to verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. Okay? So the first time I was in the, this, we see this phrase, I was in the spirit. He was on the island of Patmos. And he replied, saw his vision of the glorified Christ. The next time we see this phrase in chapter 4, the first two verses, um, an angel says, come and I will show you. And immediately he's in the spirit and he sees the vision of the throne room. Then this third time we see this phrase in chapter 17, um, uh, he says, um, the spirit said, I mean, the angel says, come, uh, I will show you. And then in verse three, the angel carried John away and he, he carried John away in the spirit and he was located in a wilderness. Then in chapter 21,
um, verses 9 and 10, we read, Then came one of the sent seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. <clears throat> That's the four times we see that phrase. Very clearly, it seems that it's dividing John's vision uh, into four different but interrelated visions. And I, I gave you a little table there of the visions. Um, uh, the first vision, the initial vision of the glorified Christ among his seven churches, that's on the island of Patmos. And I give you the full text of the vision. The second vision um, regards the divine court proceedings and trial of the nations with the seals, trumpets, and bowls. And all of that is in the heavenly throne room. And there's the text, the full text of that vision, chapter 4 through uh, the end of chapter 16. Then the third vision is the judgment of Babylon, the return of Christ, and the final judgment of humanity. And he was given that in a desert, we're told. And then the fourth and final vision is the, vindic is the vision of, of the new heavens and the new earth, the vindication and final reward of the saints in the new Jerusalem and the renewed creation. Uh, and we're told that the Spirit carried him away and gave him that vision on a high, I mean, an angel carried him away in the Spirit uh, to a high mountain and gave him that vision. So to me, those are really clear markers, um, very clear markers. And so I'm using those markers as signposts for our working roadmap. And um, I provided you uh, uh, bottom of page two and top of page three, I provided you with an outline. Um, I stole it from Kostenberger in his uh, New Testament introduction and, and adapted it a little, changed a little bit, uh, made it, uh, just some real minor changes to it. But um, I liked his because it uses these markers. It divides it up into these four different uh, visions. So anyway, um, I just provide that, I explain that to you and give that to you just so that you can have a roadmap. It's like the table, it's like a simple table of contents to a book. When I, before I even purchase a book, when I'm evaluating a book to see if I want to buy it, I go to the table of contents. I, I look at the title and and if there's a subtitle I look at that and I try to uh, and I try to uh, surmise what the idea of the book is from the title and subtitle then I go to the I don't know if you guys do this when you purchase a book but but I do this then I go to the table of contents and I look at the table of contents and I try to use the table of contents to show me the author's flow of thought, how he launches into it, and the things that he goes through, and the way he concludes things. Now, I, I've got to admit, some people, some authors get very creative about their chapter titles, and it frustrates me because it makes it hard to really follow the, their flow of thought in the table of contents. Uh, I've often wondered, are you just trying to hide it from me, your flow of thought? 
but actually they're just trying to be clever and cute uh, is all. Uh, but, but usually it works doing that, taking the title and subtitle and as an indicator of uh, the general topic and then using the uh, table of contents to uh, work through the guy's flow of thought. Then I go read the book reviews. Anyway, I, I've, I've read a lot of tables of contents. I've read a lot of book reviews. Uh, that's why I like getting these kind of outlines of a book because I'll several times throughout the whole course of study, I'll go back and I'll just go through the outline and I'll try to think my way through the outline just, just so I can, so I can let it uh, sink down in me uh, how this author put this book together, the flow of thought. So anyway, um, hopefully that will be helpful for you um, as you, as you uh, go through this study. And again, I just want to emphasize, I think the two, uh, the two best things that you can do to prep yourself is, is to be listening to the book or reading it over and over and, um, and reminding yourself of the flow of the book. And that's what that out outline will help you do. Is Mike, are you going to tell us what he means by being in the spirit? I can understand it. Being dragged away by an angel would put me in the spirit. I, is there an analog to that today? Um, we're going to look at that in two weeks. Okay. But I, but I can, you know, when we get into, when we get into, when we, in two weeks from tonight, we'll go through verses nine through 20. And we'll get into that. Okay. A good question. Anyway, any questions about the structure that I just went through? This roadmap that I just went through. That gives you an idea of how John put together his book. And when you start, when you keep reading through it or listening to it, if, uh, if I put, when I put Revelation on my Bible app and just let it read it to me, I think it takes about an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 13 minutes, something like that for it to read it straight through to me. But if you do that and if you, uh, or if you're reading it through, after you've done that a few times and you, and you keep reminding yourself of the flow of thought there, you'd be surprised at how comfortable you get with the book and how, how things, little things here and there start falling in place to you and start making sense. Doesn't, certainly doesn't answer all the questions. I'm not trying to say that, but you get comfortable with it. Um, you don't, you don't drive off the road and wreck the car. Um, so anyway, we're, we're going to go through the prologue. Let me just, let me just read the prologue. Um, that's the first eight verses of Revelation 1. And John writes, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who was to, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, 
and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, <clears throat> even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, that's a great prologue. Uh, just quickly, what's the point of a prologue? Uh, the word simply means a word before. And um, a prologue intro uh, certainly introduces the book, but it does more than that. In introducing the book, what you find is you find many of the themes that the author is going to address throughout the book, you'll find them in the prologue. So the prologue introduces you to this book by giving, giving you an idea of what kind of a book it is and what you're going to find in the book. It's much like the foyer in our church. When you enter through the foyer before you even go into the church, just by looking around and seeing the stuff uh, in the foyer and the people that you meet in the foyer, you can get an idea about what the church is like. That's an analogy, maybe not a perfect analogy, but it works for me. Um, and uh, so that's the whole purpose of a prologue, is to introduce you to the book by, um, by um, providing you with uh, info about what's going to be in the book. So, okay, so let's just, um, I've got several questions here, almost two pages of questions um, to go through in this uh, prologue. First of all, I broke the prologue up into an introduction, then a greeting and doxology, and then an announcement. So, um, uh, in the introduction there, the first three verses. In the first three verses, what did John indicate about the kind of book he wrote? Now, we talked about this last week, so this is more of a review question. But can you see two words in those first three verses that indicate uh, what kind of book John wrote? I'm sorry, Mike, could you rephrase the question or? I'll repeat it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, two words I'm looking for in those uh, first three verses, and those two words tell us what kind of book John wrote? Uh, Revelation and read, or? Pardon? Revelation and read. Revelation is one of those words. Yes, read is what you do to the book. <laughs> <laughs> like Julie saying testify? Uh, not testify. What kind of a book is it? Prophecy. Prophecy, absolutely. Revelation and prophecy. Revelation is the translation of the Greek word apoc apocalypsis. We get the word apocalypse from. So we're told that the book is going to be uh, an apocalyptic prophecy, just right there in those first two verses, okay? 
uh, apocalypse, apocalypsis means the unveiling of something. So it's going to be a book. Um, it's going to be a book that reveals things to us. Apocalyptic is also a kind of literature. And so that tells us, that tells us, um, uh, fasten your seat belts. We're going to go on a joy ride here. We're going to see a lot of stuff. Um, but so those two words tell us what kind of book it is. It's, it's a book that's going to reveal things. Uh, it's apocalyptic and it's a prophetic book. So it is going to be forecasting some things, and it's also going to be encouraging and rebuking, okay? Because prophecy does both of those functions. It forecasts, and it encourages or slash re rebukes or confronts, all right? It foretells and it foretells. So we know that's what, what we're getting in for. Now, for the apocalyptic stuff, you can just go back to the, to, uh, the last two weeks and uh, read back through all of that. But I just wanted you to pick it out yourself, uh, out of the text, okay? Uh, second question. In verse 1, what are the four steps involved in the transmission of John's prophecy to his readers. In order for that prophecy to get to us, John indicates there are four steps. Can you pick up those four steps in verse one? Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a swing. Hopefully, I don't miss. I might, but uh, it would be showing his servants, um, making it known by sending. Uh, and no, I think. Oh no, I lost my place. Okay, that was three. So I'm missing one. If let, let me ask you this question. Let me let me let me walk you through it. What's the first thing thing that we're in verse one? What is the very first thing that we're told happens to this revelation? It's it was given. Yeah. yeah. From whom to whom? Uh yeah, God, God gave, God gave it to Christ. Right. That's the first step. God gave it to Christ. What's the second step? Show his servants. Oh, wait. Yeah. Well, to make it known. Um. How did he make it known? How, who's the he there? How did Jesus make it known? He sent his angel to John. Right. So Jesus gave it to the angel. What's, this, what's the third step? Uh, who said that? Oh, angel took it to John. I said it. Yes. That's uh, that was Narupa, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's, that's right. The angel took it to John. And then what's the final step? John wrote it for us. Yes, oh, yeah. John wrote it for us. So do you see that, that chain from the father to the son to an angel to John to us? Now, one of the things that's very typical of apocalyptic literature is that it uh, is always, almost always, mediated by an angel. It's an angel giving it to um, 
the prophet, go back in Daniel and read his visions. You'll see that. Um, and I don't remember if Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, and Zechariah mentioned an angel. Uh, but very clearly, I think, yes, uh, yeah, I think Ezekiel did at times, and uh, I think, and, poss and maybe Zechariah. I should have checked that, but I didn't check that. Uh, you can check that. Um, but anyway, but that's very typical of apocalyptic literature. It's, it's given to the prophet by an angel. It's mediated by an angel. We're going to see that all the way through the book of Revelation. Um, okay. That, uh, that third question there. This, this one's interesting. I don't know if it intrigues you, but it intrigues me. Um, it was intriguing to me, so I had to find out. Um, the prophecy, we're told in verse 1, that the prophecy must take place soon because, in verse 3, the time is near. The prophecy must take place soon because the time is near. Now, at the end of Revelation, at the end of this prophecy, John, unlike Daniel is told not to seal his prophecy. Look at chapter 22, verse 10. Somebody want to read that loud and clear? And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Yeah. So in uh, the first three verses of chapter one, uh, we're told that the, that the um, prophecy must take place soon because the time is near. And then at the end of the book, in 22... 10, John's told the time is near, so don't seal up this prophecy. But look at Daniel chapter, if, if you can look at Daniel chapter 4 and 9, chapter 12, and then verses 4 and 9, Daniel is told to seal up his prophecy. And so my question is, why the different instructions to the, to the two prophets? Why was Daniel told to seal his up and John was told not to seal his up? Look in Daniel chapter 12. You see it, uh, you see it first in um, verse 4 and then a follow up in verse 9. Someone you want to read those two verses, four and nine? But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Yes. So... Um, why was Daniel told to seal up his book? They are not proximate to the end. Yeah. It's not for until the time of the end. Um, John was told not to seal up his. Why? Because the end is near. Because the end is near. Um, part of the end, part of the end has already happened. Uh, Christ's first coming is part of the end. It's, and so it's interesting to me, uh, between Daniel and Christ, there, there was, well, especially uh, 
um, at the end of Daniel in chapter 12, uh, when Daniel was in his early 80s, early to mid 80s, um, there was only a, uh, 550 years between Daniel 12 and Jesus' death. Uh, something like that, 550, 560. Uh, but he says it's, uh, it's, it's for the time of the end. Seal it up. By the way, seal it doesn't mean to hide it. Seal means to protect it. Uh, you, the reason you seal a scroll, uh, and we're going to see one in chapter 4 and 5, the reason you seal a scroll is to protect it. Um, anyway, he's, he's saying, you know, protect this scroll, save it, protect it, save it, because it's not until the time of the end. Well, 550 years later, uh, um, or 600 years, if you want to go from Daniel 12 to, to John in Revelation, 600 years later, uh, we're already in the latter times, and John's told, hey, man, the end's near. Do not seal up this book. It's just interesting to me that since John was told that the time is near, uh, it's been 2,000 years almost. But the time between Daniel and Jesus was... Um, 550 years or 600 years at the most. So I, I don't know if that sort of stuff intrigues you. Uh, um, it's just intriguing to me that Daniel's 600 years away from uh, the time of the end, so he had to seal up his book. John was told it's going to take place soon, so don't seal your book, and it's been 2,000 years. Is it talking about the same end? Yes, I think I think um, I think it's the latter times, which would be both uh, would be from uh, Christ's first coming to his second coming. Um, but uh, I think I think the difference here is that uh, much of uh, there's a lot of Daniel that had to do with after Messiah came. And um, um, and so he was to preserve that book until Messiah comes and it's the time of the end. Well, Messiah came 2,000 years ago and we've been in uh, the time of the end for 2,000 years. And I think the big difference here, I think uh, the other difference here, or the other message here, is John is being told, hey, the readers are going to need this. We are now in the time of the end, and the readers are going to need that, need this. And, and so all readers uh, through the uh, throughout these 20 centuries that have passed since, since almost 20 centuries since John wrote this, have needed what was written in this scroll uh, or in Revelation. So now I do know that Daniel was important to the intertestamental uh, nation of Israel. Um, when they uh, when uh, they were going through severe trials at the hand of Antiochus Epiphanes and 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 other kings, but pri primarily Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, um, Daniel was a very comforting book to them. But by and large. Um, Daniel was to preserve his book for the time of the end. We are in the end times, and we've been in the end times 
for 2,000 years. So uh, that also gives us an idea of what he means that the time is near, the end is near. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, days away. He's not talking uh, necessarily in units of time here when he says it's near. What he's talking about is it is at hand. Uh, it, it is happening. It's just that the end, God plans for a very, for a very long end. Uh, and we saw in Second Peter, why is the end taking so long? Remember from Second Peter? Why is the end? Is it because God doesn't really have all of the power he needs to actually bring the end, uh, to actually execute the end? or bring it about? Why is it taking him so long? Why is the ending taking so long? His, all his children have to come to a saving knowledge of him. He's yes. not slow concerning his practice, but his long suffering, is that the verse? Yeah, it's his patience. Patience, right. His patience in, in rescuing many from uh, their sin and judgment, rescuing many. That uh, second P uh, Peter refers to that as God's patience. That's why the ending is taking so long. Yeah. But uh, the book of Revelation is about what takes place in the whole ending, which means it applies to uh, the whole time from Christ's first coming to his second coming. Yes, that's exactly what uh, Jan said. Uh, what came to her mind is the verse in Second Peter, where Peter tells us that uh, a day, uh, uh, a thousand years, is like a day to the Lord. Um, so it's not because he's unwilling. It's not because he's unable. It's because he's patient and he's saving many, many people uh, before the final curtain drops. Okay. Now in verse two, how does John describe his prophecy? He's saying, John is saying um, that he bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So all three of those things apply to the book of Revelation. John is saying that um, um, that this revelation that he was given, that the angel, that Christ made it known to John through his angel, uh, he refers to it as, as uh, a witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So everything that John saw and wrote down here for us, he is referring to it as the word of God and the testimony of, of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, anyway, that's the, the other thing that I wanted to point out to you is when he says, even to all that he saw, what John, what that implies is what John is writing to for us is things that he saw. And so what kind of expectations 
should we have? Well, we already know it's apocalyptic. And he said it's things that he saw. So he's describing things that he saw. So we should be expecting lots of, lots of different uh, images, lots of movement, motion, action. Scenes keep, keep uh, changing. Uh, that's what we expect to see. I mean, that's what we expect to read because John is recording what he's seeing. Uh, this apocalypse, apocalypse that uh, is being revealed to him. Okay? So it's going to be full of action. Now, in, in um, verse 3, um, and, and I'm going to get back to what we just said about verse 2 in a moment, but in verse 3, um, we're given the first of seven blessings. And I've written down the other blessings uh, that's found in Revelation. There's, there's seven blessings, seven beatitudes um, throughout uh, the book of Revelation. This is the very first one. So in verse three, how is this first blessing received? It's uh, received to those who read it aloud, the words of prophecy. Yep, those who read it aloud, yes. Any any other way? And who hear? Yes. And what else is involved in receiving oh, the blessing? Oh, um, who hear and who keep what is written in it. Yes, exactly. Um, now what, what John is referring to in the typical first century church, here's the way it would go. They would have a letter uh, or communication from one of the apostles or those writing on behalf of the apostles. And somebody would get up in the church meeting and read the letter or the book out loud. Because this is, this is before they had copies of it. And it, and it would have been, uh, most of the people wouldn't have been able to afford to have it copied or buy a copy or anything like that. So somebody would have it, a reader would have it, they would stand up in the midst of the congregation and they would read it out. And John is, uh, so what the, what, uh, the people sitting in the congregation uh, would be hearing is all of this stuff that John saw, the reader would be reading it uh, out loud. Can you imagine? Just, just think about this picture. Somebody got up and took an hour and 15 minutes in, in the meeting and they read through Revelation. And John said, the one that read it and all of those that heard it and take its message to heart uh, are blessed. Now, can you imagine um, somebody getting up on a Sunday morning at GBF and reading through the whole book of Revelation and expecting you to go away blessed? But that's that's what's that's what's uh, happening here. Now, as these people are listening to the book read, remember, they're very familiar with and comfortable with apocalyptic writings. Uh, and they get all the cultural and historical references. They know, they get right away who the beast is referring to. Uh, they get right away who the harlot is referring to. There's a lot of these things. And, and as you go through Revelation 2 and 3 and read through the letters to the seven churches, they get the references uh, and everything that's being said. So they're sitting there 
And I don't know, maybe they close their eyes so they can envision uh, the, uh, the images that John is writing about uh, uh, in the Revelation. There may be a lot of details that they don't remember, but they get, they see the images, they get a lot of the references, and they're steeped in the Old Testament. They know when, when John is uh, referring to something that's in the Old Testament. And, and so what I'm saying is this book is meant to be helpful to us, even as we just make a habit of reading it through and listening to it with the intent of taking its message to heart because that's the that's what was happening in the first century church okay any questions about that well they weren't reading a lot of hardy boys mysteries were they no they weren't you know, in Ezra too, he 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 followed that pattern, and everybody stood up. I think back then, didn't they? He was on a yes on an apple crate or something, and <laughs> he read through the whole wall. Huh? Read the yeah. It was probably a fig crate. <laughs> okay. uh, yes, he read through the whole law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. I mean, suppose. I suppose it could have been just Deuteronomy, but um, it also could have been Genesis through Deuteronomy. And yeah. then not only that, after he read through the whole thing, then they broke out in discussion groups with the priests and went yeah. through it. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And the people were blessed. Uh, what were you saying about attention spans, Phil? <laughs> well, I I don't think we have the attention span to listen to that, even if we were real familiar with the circumstances. <laughs> that would be well, my uh, pardon. That would be my confession. Yes, yes. Sure. Uh, how does Jesus refer to it as? Um, uh, let's see. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> yeah. Can you not pray with me for an hour? Oh, boy. Uh, yes. We're going to have to finish this prologue um, next week because somebody spent a whole lot of time talking about the structure in two weeks, in two <laughs> weeks from tonight. Somebody spent a whole lot of time talking about how John put the book together. So we're going to have to put this... Uh, Finish this prologue uh, next time we meet in two weeks. So um, let uh, let's close in prayer so Deepak can stop the recording, and then we'll talk about our next meeting. And if there's any questions that anybody has of what we went over tonight, we can talk about them as well. So. Um, um, Joe, would you like to close us in prayer? Father God, we thank you for this time in your word. I thank you for, for the time that Mike has spent in studying and how you have gifted him and give him understanding um, to be able to relay and to um, explain your word to us. We thank you, Father, for um, how you have given us everything that we need um, to, to understand and to, uh, to know you and to become more like you, Father. And uh, I do want to lift up Mike and Pam as they travel tomorrow. I pray, Father, that you would just give them safe travel. I pray that you would keep them healthy. I pray, Father, that you would bless their time with um, Tim and Katie and Jade, and um, that you would give them safe travel back home. And Father, I also want to lift up Janelle, and I just pray that you would continue to be, be with her. And um, as she is getting very close to time for um, 
for this delivery. And we just ask you to be with us. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for coming. Amen. Amen. Okay. And, and all God's dogs said amen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>